find ourselves this evening in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. Hopefully you have an outline. They were on the back table, and you'll see there's actually two outlines there. I wasn't sure which outline to go with, so I have a homiletical preaching outline, which is a little bit more simple with four basic points, and then I had an exegetical outline that's a little bit more detailed that probably more comprehensively deals with the structure of the text. I've decided to go with the first one. I think it's a little bit simpler to follow along, so... You have the other one there, that's free of charge. <laughs> uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. Let me just begin our time by reading the text. Notice Peter writes, starting in verse 13, 1 Peter 2, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering from, for evil, but as, use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, tonight we continue in the second major section of Peter's first epistle here. If you remember the first section in 1 Peter 1, 1 to 1 Peter 2, 10 dealt with the believer's salvation. Now in the second section in chapter 2, verse 11 to chapter 3, verse 12, essentially deals with the believer's submission. For example, in 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, Peter calls Christian citizens to submit to the governing authorities that have been placed over them even to evil governments like the one that Peter's readers found themselves under in God's providence, namely led by wicked Nero. 1 Peter 2, 18 to 25, Peter calls Christian household servants or slaves to submit to their masters, even to unjust and unreasonable masters. In 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6, Peter calls Christian wives to submit to their husbands, even to unbelieving husbands. And so we're in this section dealing with the submission of the believer to the authorities that God has placed over them. And tonight we'll be looking specifically at 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17, dealing with our submission to the government. The question is, why does Peter all of a sudden bring up this topic of submission? Where did this come from? Well, the reason this is so urgent in Peter's mind is because of what he's just said in the previous four verses. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 9, Peter said that Christians are a chosen race, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. It said in chapter 2, verse 10, that we are the people of God. It said in chapter 2, verse 11, that we're aliens and strangers here in this world. So all of that raises the obvious question then, do we have any allegiance to the institutions of this world? See, the obvious question for Peter's readers would have been this, since Christ is now our Lord and Master, shouldn't we just completely ignore the emperor and those appointed by him? In other, human, in other words, human institutions and governmental authorities? And since we're now strangers and aliens here in this world, and our true citizenship is in heaven, shouldn't we just disregard the laws of this land? And since the word of God is now our charter and our constitution and our governing authority, shouldn't we just ignore the constitutions of this world? Well, Peter's answer to those questions is no. Because the word of God commands us to submit to the authority structures that God has sovereignly ordained and placed over us. And in particular here, the government. If you remember in this context here, of 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, Peter said that the way that we live out our salvation in Christ and our identity as aliens and strangers here in this world is first negatively by abstaining from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul, verse 11, and then second positively by keeping our behavior morally excellent among the Gentiles, that is among pagan unbelievers, so that they would see our good deeds and be converted by means of them, God using them in conjunction with the gospel, and they would ultimately glorify God in the day of visitation. And the very first application of this principle, 
The very first way that we can keep our behavior morally excellent for gospel witness and for God's glory is by submitting to the human authorities that God has sovereignly placed over us. Now, it's interesting how Peter places this, these staccato commands here to submit 2.13, 2.18, right after he just got done talking about fleshly lust that wage war against the soul in verse 11. I think the reason why he did that is because one of the fleshly lusts that wages war against our soul is the lust of pride that reigns in every human heart. That insatiable desire to be independent and autonomous, to be governed by self-rule, that anti-authoritarian spirit within all of us that says nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm my own boss, I'm my own authority. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and no one's going to tell me differently. And so the question for us tonight isn't whether this attitude of insubordination resides within us. The question is to what degree does it reside within us? How aware are we of its presence in our life? And three, what are we doing about it? You see, this spirit of rebellion and insubordination is endemic to fallen man. Read Romans 8, 6-8. And so Peter, knowing this and knowing how arrogant and rebellious and stubborn we all are by nature, knew that this would be one of the ways in which fleshly lusts would wage war against the soul, verse 11. And so Peter says, although you've been redeemed, chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, although you're now strangers and aliens here, chapter 2, verse 11, and although you're now citizens of heaven, you're to demonstrate that reality by submitting to the emperor, in this case, for Peter's readers, Nero, and to those governing authorities appointed by him. You see, the central theme of this section is found in the very first word of verse 13, submit. That's the main verb, the main imperative, and the main point of this section here in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. And like I said, this doesn't come easily or naturally for us. In fact, I remember a time as a brand new Christian when I was driving somewhere. It was late. I ended up making a wrong turn and getting lost. I realized that I was going the wrong way on the highway and that I needed to turn around, but I didn't know where I'd be able to do that. I didn't know how far the next exit was. I wasn't familiar with the area. As I was driving, I saw one of those large no U-turn signs, emergency vehicles only. Now, it didn't occur to me to turn there until I saw the sign and thought to myself, well, I know that it says no U-turn, but I'm lost and I'm late. So I thought to myself, this could save me several minutes. So I looked around, didn't see any police cars, and I ended up making this illegal U-turn. Well, it wasn't but a few seconds after doing that that the Spirit of God instantly and immediately convicted me. I thought to myself, why is it that I would sin against God and do something like that? And I think the reason was twofold. First, I saw an advantage to disobeying the authorities that God had sovereignly placed over me. It was going to enable me to get to my destination sooner. And second, I saw that I could get away with it. There were no police officers around. And every one of us is tempted to disobey human authorities for those same two reasons. Disobedience brings some kind of advantage to us that we want, and we're pretty sure that we won't get caught. You might summarize it like this, the promise of a benefit and the assurance of getting away with it. So the question is, in those moments, when it feels like we have a pretty good reason to disobey legitimate, God-ordained human authority, and it seems that there's a really good chance that no one's going to find out, that there won't be any negative consequences, why is it that we should submit? Why not disobey? Why not make the illegal U-turn? Why not compromise slightly on your taxes? Because after all, it's not that big a deal, right? Here in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17, Peter provides for us four motivations to submit to the government, to the governing authorities that God's placed over us. And really, these principles extend to just about any relationship that calls for submission. 
Whether we're talking about a wife seeking to submit to her husband, Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, Colossians 3, 18, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6, or an employer seeking to submit to their or an employee seeking to submit to their employer, Ephesians 6, verses 5 to 6, Colossians 3, 22 to 24, or a child seeking to submit to their parents, Ephesians 6, 1, or members of the church seeking to submit to the elders that God has placed over them, Hebrews 13, 17, or a citizen seeking to submit to the government, Romans 13, 1 to 7, Titus 3, 1 to 2, and 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Regardless of the precise circumstances or relationship, this passage is going to give us a strong and clear biblical motivation to submit to authority even when we don't feel like it. Or maybe I should say especially when we don't feel like it. And so if you're here tonight and you struggle to submit in a certain relationship to the human authority that God has placed over you, you wrestle with it, maybe you don't want to in your heart of hearts, this is a great opportunity tonight to have your heart challenged and for you to be brought to repentance and for you to say, I know God calls me to submit, and so I want that to be my heart. Or maybe you're here tonight and you do desire to submit, but sometimes you find that you lack motivation or the right mindset. Well, here in 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, Peter provides for us, again, four motivations to submit to the government. First, we're going to see our obligation to the human authority, verses 13 to 14a. Second, we're going to see our loyalty to the Lord Jesus, verse 13a. Third, we're going to see our testimony to a watching world, verse 14b to verse 15. And then fourth, we're going to see our commitment to a higher authority, verses 16 and 17. So the first motivation to submit to the government is our obligation to the human authority, verse 13 to verse 14a. Notice Peter commands us here in verse 13 to 14a to submit to the human authorities that God has placed over us. He writes, starting in verse 13, submit yourselves. There it is. That's the main command, the main imperative. For the Lord's sake to every human institution, and he defines for us what it is that he means by every human institution when he says, whether to a king as to as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. So the main command here is in verse 13, where Peter writes, submit yourselves to every human institution. Literally, the Greek text reads, submit yourselves to every human creature. But Peter defines for us here what he means by every human creature, every human institution, when he says, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him. Now, the emperor at this time, which was Nero, would have been like the president for us today. He ruled over the whole empire of Rome. And the governors sent by him in verse 14 would have been those appointed by the emperor Nero to rule over the various provinces in the Roman Empire, kind of like the five provinces that Peter mentions in verse 1 of chapter 1, much like our governors today. So what Peter's saying here is submit yourselves to every human institution. That is to Nero the emperor or king, as it's translated here, and to the governors, kind of like Pilate and others, who have been appointed by him. In other words, not only are you to submit to the highest human authority, namely the emperor or the president for us, but also to those in authority, including the governors as sent by him. For us, perhaps senators governors, judges, policemen, etc. In other words, Peter's calling for a comprehensive submission to the government or state here. And I think the reason that Peter literally says to every human creature is to remind his readers that the rulers they're called to submit to are merely creatures, created by God, appointed by God, and existing under his lordship, his rule. And so from top to bottom, Peter says, you have an obligation to submit to the governing authorities, to every human institution that God has placed over you. Now, folks, this would have been somewhat shocking considering how deranged Nero was. And yet that's exactly what Peter says here. And so this is a needful reminder, especially for those of us who find it difficult to submit to immoral, unethical, unjust presidents and politicians that God has sovereignly placed over us, where we're real quick to discount them and their authority because we don't agree with their morality. 
If Peter is calling his readers to submit to wicked Nero here, who would eventually light Christians on fire and use them as torches to light his garden parties, then how much more ought we to submit to the leaders over us? Now, this verb, submit here, at the beginning of verse 13, is the Greek verb hupotasso. It's a compound verb in Greek made up of the preposition hupo, which means under, and the verb tasso, which means to order, arrange, or set in place. And so, literally, it means to order, arrange, set in place under something else. And so, as you think about the word picture here, it involves placing ourselves under the authority of another who is over us. Peter says, place yourselves under every legitimate God-ordained governing authority by obeying them and submitting to them. In the New Testament, we see this same word submit being used of demons obeying the apostles, Luke 10, 17, of wives submitting to husbands, Ephesians 5, 24, 1 Peter 3, 1, of the church submitting to Christ, Ephesians 5, 24, of believers submitting to God, James 4, 7, of believers submitting to the elders of the church, 1 Peter 5, 5, and you see, what this involves is not only recognizing someone else's authority over you, but also the humility to submit to that authority in obedience. And so first, we have to recognize their rightful place of authority over us. And then second, we have to humble ourselves and submit to that authority in obedience, joyfully arranging ourselves under that authority. Peter says that's what God calls us to do with the government, with the laws of the land. We need to recognize our obligation to human authority here and let that motivate us to submit in obedience. I remember one time being with a group of friends and one of the people I was with was telling us about a new movie that he had just bought on DVD. One of the people in the group said, oh, can you burn me a copy of that? The guy responded by saying, actually, I can't. That's against the law. That's stealing. There's copyright laws that prohibit me from doing that. And the person who asked him basically looked at him like he was from a different planet. Unfortunately, that's the reaction of many professing Christians when it comes to obeying and submitting to human authority. Kind of like, what's the big deal? It's not hurting anyone. No one's going to know. See, many Christians have lost this sense of their moral obligation to legitimate God-ordained human authority. And one of the reasons is because we want to be our own authority. We want to be independent and autonomous. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. We want to do what we think is wisest and best and what's easiest and most comfortable and convenient for us, regardless of whether or not it's a violation of the law or not. But Peter says here, we must bring ourselves under the governing authorities that God has placed over us, whether we like it or not, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's going to immediately benefit us or not. We must submit. We must obey. This is a command in the Greek text placing a demand on our will that we must comply with. When we see a no U-turn sign, we must realize that that's not ultimately the ordinance of man, but the ordinance of God, as Paul tells us in Romans 13, 1 and 2. And so to say, I don't care what that sign says is in effect to say, I don't care what God says. You see, those individuals who continually have difficulty with human authority ultimately have their problem with divine authority, with God's authority. Listen carefully. Unless that human authority is requiring you to sin against God, unless they're commanding you to do something that God forbids or forbidding you to do something that God commands, you must submit yourself to every legitimate God-ordained human authority. There's not a whole lot of wiggle room there. This is a command. This is a non-negotiable. And this isn't an isolated teaching. We see this call for believers to submit to the governing authorities in Romans 13, 1 to 7, and also in Titus 3, 1 and 2. And so as one writer has well said, quote, from the Supreme Court to the traffic court, from income tax to parking regulations, believers are to be subject to duly constituted authority, end quote. And so Peter commands us to submit to governing authorities because of our obligation to the human authority that God has placed over us. So let me ask you tonight, how are you doing in this area of submission? 
especially in your submission to the government as Peter's dealing with here? Do you find that there's a submissiveness in your heart even when you don't agree with the laws of the leaders over you? Or do you find yourself murmuring and complaining and potentially even being unsubmissive in your heart and even worse in your actions where you make subtle or perhaps not so subtle compromises rebelling against the authorities that God has placed over you? Ultimately rebelling against God and His authority. Let me ask you, do you spend more time praying for the president and his conversion, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, or criticizing the president and sinfully slandering the president? Peter says, submit yourselves to every human institution. And so the first motivation to submit to the government is our obligation to the human authority, verse 13 to verse 14a. But Peter doesn't stop there. He gives us a second motivation to submit to the government, namely our loyalty to the Lord Jesus, verse 13a. Our loyalty to the Lord Jesus. Now this is very significant because our tendency in matters of submission to human authority is to forget about Christ altogether and somehow to think that he's irrelevant to the whole issue. But notice how Peter exhorts his readers here to obey the governing authorities. He writes in verse 13, submit yourselves. Why, Peter? Here it is. Here's the motivation. For the Lord's sake to every human institution. And so when Peter says for the Lord's sake, he's supplying us with some very helpful and meaningful motivation here. And what's interesting is that the Greek word translated Lord, kurios here, is a word that the Romans would often use in reference to the Roman Empire as their Lord. In this case, it was Nero. You see, here in verse 13, it refers specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Peter's doing here is telling his readers that they are indeed to submit to human authority, but he's ultimately pointing them beyond the human authority to a greater motivation and a higher authority, namely divine authority, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's essentially saying, submit yourself to the Lord, lowercase l, for the sake of the Lord, uppercase l. Peter's saying submit to the governing authorities for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't mean for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense that it will benefit him in some way, but rather in the sense that he's saying submit yourselves to every human institution because of the Lord. In other words, Christ is the reason or the motivation for your submission. You can think of it this way. You're to submit to them because of him. As Tom Schreiner writes, they obey the injunctions of governing authorities ultimately because of their reverence for and submission to the Lord. And so we should submit to human authority because we love Christ and long to be obedient to Him and His authority. We long to honor Him, to glorify to Him, to testify to Him as Lord of our life. And so the ultimate motivation for our submission to the government is our desire to exalt, exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to see Him magnified and glorified. And we tremble at the thought of ever dishonoring Him, displeasing Him, distrusting Him, or disobeying Him. Bringing reproach upon His name or sullying His reputation through our insubordination. And so we submit to them because of Him, out of His desire to honor Him to submit to his ultimate authority as the one who is truly Lord. And so we're to obey the government, not just because we want to avoid penalty or punishment, as verse 14b we'll talk about, although we certainly want to avoid that, and although that's certainly a legitimate motivation. And we're to obey the government, not just because we want to be praised, verse 14b, and recognized by others as a morally upstanding, law-abiding citizen, although we certainly do want to be known for that, not for our own glory, but for the glory of Christ and our witness to the watching world. But ultimately, we're to obey the government, Peter says, because of our reverence for and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ as an act of worship to Christ. You see, verse 13 subordinates all submission on earth to a higher submission to Christ. To submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. And so the reason we don't make that a legal U-turn is not ultimately because we might get a ticket, but ultimately for Christ's sake. The reason we're honest and we pay our taxes is not ultimately because we want to avoid the IRS coming after us, but because we want to worship and serve Christ. 
even when no one else sees or knows because we know that he always sees and he always knows. And we're really living for him, his honor, his glory, his smile, his pleasure. Not based on fear of people and what they can do to us, not based on the praise and admiration of others. And so submission to human authority is ultimately motivated by a desire to submit to divine authority and to honor the Lord who is the ultimate authority. And on the other hand, disobedience to human authority is ultimately disobedience to divine authority and to the Lord. When we illegally burn that DVD that we didn't pay for, it's ultimately disobedience to and rebellion against God and His authority. And so Peter commands us to submit to human government ultimately for the Lord's sake as an act of worship to Him. So let me ask you, what is your ultimate and supreme motivation for submitting to the governing authorities over you? Is it truly to honor Christ and to worship Him? Do you consciously think about that when you obey the road signs or the copyright laws or the IRX ta IRS tax policies? Or is your submission done ultimately to avoid punishment or penalty or to gain some recognition from others as a moral person? Peter says that our ultimate motivation for submission to legitimate God-ordained human authority is to be for the Lord's sake. Well, notice he gives us a third motivation, not only because of our obligation to the human authority, verse 13 to verse 14a, not, all, not only because of our loyalty to the Lord Jesus, verse 13a, but thirdly now our testimony to a watching world, verse 14b to verse 15. We see this a little bit at the end of verse 14, and then we see it very clearly in verse 15. Notice at the end of verse 14, Peter reminds his readers of the purpose of the Roman governors commissioned by the emperor. In fact, let me start back in verse 13. Peter writes, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to the governors as sent by him. And why are they sent by him? What is their purpose? He says, For the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. And so Peter gives us here one of the divine purposes of the government. One of the primary roles of government is to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do right. That is part of the grace of God in instituting human government. Because if you think about all the depraved people that are running around in this world, who are hostile to God, enemies of God, haters of God, lovers of self, enslaved to sin, haters of others, as Titus 3, 3 tells us. Human government is there to restrain human wickedness and chaos and anarchy to a certain extent by punishing those who do what is evil. And in doing so, human government is able to establish a better measure of order and civilization and control to what would otherwise be complete anarchy in this world. Every man for himself. We see it sometimes during riots or civil revolutions when governments are no longer ruling the people. People are looting, people are stealing, people are killing one another. And so Peter says one of the divine purposes of the government is to establish and maintain order by restraining to some degree evil and wickedness. It's very important that you understand it doesn't do this in a salvific sense, okay? Okay. It doesn't change someone's heart. It doesn't bring about regeneration. There's a great limit to the government. But that is part of the divine role of the government, to punish evil and thereby to act externally as a deterrent to evil. In his book, Why Government Can't Save You, John MacArthur writes this, quote, Even the poorest form of government is better than no government at all. It's frightening to imagine what would occur in any society in which no one was in charge. Anarchy is disastrous. If citizens had only themselves to protect their lives and property, strife would result almost immediately, and soon any order would collapse. To prevent such bleak, a bleak scenario, God established human government to restrain evildoers and lawbreakers, end quote. It's well said. That's what Peter's saying here. He's saying that the governments that are there to punish evildoers... Now, let me just say as a footnote that Peter hardly intended to say here that rulers always fulfill such a purpose. Okay? He was quite aware from the Old Testament examples of Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and even his own situation with Nero that rulers may resist God and his will and fail to fulfill God's purpose for the government. 
Okay, the per persecution of believers in this letter clearly indicates that the rulers may very well have been involved in unjustly oppressing believers. Furthermore, Christians could hardly forget that Christ was unjustly condemned under Pontius Pilate or that James was put to death by Herod Agrippa, Acts 12. So what verse 14 expresses is not necessarily what Nero and his provincial governors aimed to do. Nero, in fact, beheaded Paul and crucified Peter upside down. Rather, what we see here in verse 14 is an expression of what God designed government for. You see, the proper aim of government is to dam up the river of evil that flows from the heart of man so that it does not flood the world with anarchy. But governments do not save. They are, however, intended by God to maintain external order in a world seething with evil so that the saving message of the gospel can run forth and triumph. That's why Paul urged us in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, to pray for kings and those who are in authority. Because he desires that the gospel not be hindered by upheaval. And so even the most oppressive governments hold in check, to some degree, to some extent, evil. Preventing society from collapsing into complete anarchy. And so the idea that Peter's getting at here in verse 14, when he says that the purpose of the governing authorities is for the punishment of evildoers, is quite similar to Romans 13, 3-4, where Paul writes this. For it, speaking of the government, is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Then Paul goes on to say in that same context, therefore, be in subjection to the law. In other words, be afraid to break the law because of the punishment that will come upon you if you do break the law. And then on the other side of the coin, notice what we see here in 1 Peter 2.14, that the government exists not only for the punishment of evildoers, but also for the praise of those who do right. That is to give proper recognition to those who do what is good. You see, back in Roman culture, it was very common to do things like erect a statue or perhaps grant privileges or publicly commend those people who did things that were a benefit and a help to the community or the society. Now, just as a side note here, Unlike Peter's readers, here in America, we get a say in who is elected to the government. And therefore, as believers who understand, one, the purposes of God in government, and two, having the privilege to help choose those appointed to the government, we should seek to choose individuals who are committed to what the Bible says is the purpose of government. Namely, the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do good. And so, frankly, it's sad when professing Christians are only concerned with voting for politicians who represent their particular ethnic group. Voting for politicians who are going to benefit them some way economically or financially. And not ultimately concerned with upholding moral biblical principles and biblical priorities like the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. As we stop here, Peter says that, as we step back here, Peter says that avoiding punishment as an evildoer, verse 14a, and garnering praise for doing what is right, verse 14b, certainly should motivate us to fall into the category of those who do what's right rather than the category of the evildoer. But here in verse 15, Peter goes on to give us an even higher motivation for doing what is right, because for us as believers, Jesus, in Jesus Christ, the issue isn't merely avoiding punishment or being praised. The issue is our testimony before a watching world. In fact, look at what Peter writes in verse 15. For such is the will of God that by doing right, in other words, as a believer, that is the category that you ought to fall into. Doing what is right, submitting to the government. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Peter says that as you live your life under the authority of the government and before the eyes of a watching world, make sure you submit to every human institution and do what is right in the sight of, sight of both God and man, because in doing so, Peter says, you will fulfill God's will for you, verse 15, and you will also silence the ignorance of foolish men. The word silence here means to to tie shut or to muzzle something, like you would muzzle a vicious dog. 
It's used as a figure of speech here to stop the mouth so that the objector's unable to say anything. They want to throw an accusation at you. But because you've done what is morally right in your relationship to the civil government, you've silenced them. And so any accusation that they would make now against you would ultimately be baseless and groundless. They cannot bring any legitimate complaint or accusation against you. They have no cause for discrediting you because you are in fact submitting to the human authority that God has ordained, namely the government. You are in fact doing what is morally excellent and morally right. And so their rejection of the Christian faith will not have any legitimate basis. It's what Jesus did to the Sadducees in Matthew 22. He silenced them. And when Peter uses the term ignorance here, he's not talking about intellectual ignorance. He's talking about a moral blindness which makes people unwilling and unable to perceive the true nature of the Christian faith. They suppress it in their unrighteousness. And the word foolish here is not really a denigration of their intellectual capacities. Peter's likely hearkening back here to the book of Proverbs where the foolish are morally debased. That is, they're foolish because they do not fear the Lord and walk in his ways and submit to his authority, and hence their ignorance is culpable ignorance. And so Peter says foolishness is bound up in their heart, and that's why they're bringing these false accusations against you. But don't do anything that makes their accusations valid. If you do what's right, then you will silence those accusations. Now, what is Peter talking here about in this context? What is the ignorance of foolish men? Well, look back at verse 12. And just as a side note here, it's always helpful to do this as you study the scriptures. You read the entire book as a whole. You read through 1 Peter, and you inductively start to pick out indications of what was going on in the churches there in Asia Minor, and it gives you a clearer understanding of the historical background, and it puts you in a much better position to understand the scriptures in their original context, and it helps you to understand God's original intent in communicating what he did through the human writer. And so look at verse 12. Peter says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, meaning the pagan unbelievers around you. Why? So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, so there it is, that they're slandering you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So we have a little bit of a clue here. Peter's readers are being slandered. They're being falsely accused. They're being called evildoers here. Notice in chapter 3, verse 16, Peter writes, Keep a good conscience. Why? So that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Look at chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. Peter says, Live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And all of this, they're surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. And what do they do? They malign you. And so that kind of fills in the gaps for us and gives us some insight as to what's going on here. The believers here in Asia Minor were taking a stand for righteousness. They were seeking to keep their behavior morally excellent, chapter 2, verse 12. They're seeking to keep a good conscience, one that is enlightened by the scriptures, informed by the scriptures, and morally clean in light of the scriptures, to be characterized by good behavior, chapter 3, verse 16. They were abstaining from fleshly lusts that dominated their pre-conversion past, chapter 4, verses 2 to 4, and as a result of this, they're being slandered, they're being falsely accused. And with that understanding of the historical context, we return to 1 Peter 2.15, and we understand that when Peter refers to the ignorance of foolish men, he's referring to that slander. And so Peter says, if you're going to silence their ignorance, their foolish and false and slanderous accusations that they're bringing against you, the way to do it is by living a life of righteousness. Such pe pe people, Peter says, will be silenced by the good deeds and the submissiveness of Christians to human authority. Peter's point here is not that good behavior of Christians will always be commended or that Christians will always avoid persecution, but rather it will expose that the slanderous attacks on believers are indeed groundless and baseless accusations. They have no warrant to them. 
Opponents will be discovered to be animated by hatred lacking any objective ground for their criticism of believers. One writer says, quote, perhaps there's even the hint that some would see the good conduct of believers and glorify God by believing in the gospel like we saw in 1 Peter 2.12, though that point is not explicitly made here, end quote. And so Peter's saying we should be driven and motivated by a desire to uphold Christ's reputation in the world. And that should spur us on to the kind of noble submission to human authority that catches the attention of even unbelievers. You see, the most submissive people in the world ought to be Christians because we've got the greatest motivation to submit. We long to see God honored and can't stand the thought of seeing him dishonored through our insubordination, through our sinful conduct. And we long to see others converted through the power of our testimony and our transformed lives. And so as those whose hearts have been brought into submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to be the models of submission in society. And yet, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Listen, your testimony is far more valuable than whatever selfish benefit you might stand to gain by rebelling or disobeying or being insubordinate to human authority. And so Peter says, submit to the government because of your testimony to a watching world. And so let me ask you, when, you're, when people in your sphere of influence, particularly the unbelieving people around you, watch your life, what kind of testimony do they see? Do they see a model of submission that is countercultural and radically different from the unbelieving world around them? Or do they see you complaining about and slandering the authorities just like they do? Being insubordinate just like they are? Making the same compromises and taking the same shortcuts that they take? Do you find that you're motivated to submit because you desire to see Christ exalted and unbelievers not just silenced, but ultimately saved as a result of your transformed life? Peter says you should and you must. Fourth and final motivation, not only our obligation to the human authority, our loyalty to the Lord Jesus, our testimony to the watching world, but finally our commitment to a higher authority, verses 16 and 17 our commitment to a higher authority, namely God, ultimately fearing him as his bond slaves. So notice Peter writes in verses 16 and 17, and look for the word God here. He says, act or submit as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering from evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, if you're reading from the NASB, as I am, you'll notice that the first word in verse 16, act, is in italics. And that's not for emphasis. Rather, it's the translator's way of letting you know that they've supplied that verb there because there's no verb in the original text. In the Greek text, the verse reads like this, as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but as bond slaves of God. And so grammatically, this word as ultimately connects back up to the main verb in verse 13, submit. So think of verse 16 as a continuation of that command in which Peter now tells his readers, submit yourselves as free men, or submit yourselves in the manner as those who are free. See, Peter says here, you are indeed free. That is, you're free from bondage and slavery to sin, but don't use your freedom as a covering for evil, as a veil for evil in a way that's sinful. In other words, don't rebel against the Roman Empire and use the fact that you're citizens of a higher kingdom now as a way to try to conceal the sin of insubordination and rebellion in your hearts. Rather, he says, use your freedom as bond slaves of God who are submissive to the human authority because you're citizens of the true king. You see, genuine freedom doesn't liberate believers from obeying God and from submitting to human authority and from doing what is right. Rather, genuine freedom liberates us to obey God and to submit to human authority and to do what's right. And so those who use their freedom as a license for evil reveal that they're not truly free. Since a life of wickedness is the very de definition of slavery. In fact, genuine freedom is experienced only by those who are God's slaves because as Romans 6 tells us, you're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of God. 
And so true liberty, according to the New Testament, means that there is a freedom to do what is right. Hence, only those who are under God's lordship obey the government as God's servants and bond slaves. And so Peter is using the believer's relationship with God here as a motivation to submission to the government. He's saying as those who are bond slaves of God, as those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and now belong to him as his slaves, he says this commitment to a higher authority, namely God's authority, should actually spur you on toward a commitment to this human authority. And so rather than seeing our allegiance to the government and our allegiance to God as mutually exclusive or incompatible, seeing the higher authority being a motivation to disobey the human authority, rather, Peter says, you should see your allegiance to God as a motivation to submit to the government. What does Paul say in Romans 13, 1 and 2? He says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And so scripture says, submit to the human authority because of your commitment, your allegiance to the divine authority. Submit to human authority because your commitment to a higher authority. And then notice that Peter concludes this section with four bullet point commands here in verse 17. It says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, that is believers, fear God, honor the king or the emperor. Now, the first command here is an aorist imperative calling for decisive and definitive action, while the remaining three commands are present tense imperatives calling for ongoing continual obedience to these commands. And so Peter starts with the broadest possible conception, all people, and then he kind of narrows the scope here. And so notice first, Peter says, honor all people, recognizing that they are made in the image of God. And so we do not respect, disrespect, or demean them. We honor them, acknowledging that they reflect our maker, James 3, 9. And folks, we have to be cautious because when we speak in a demeaning way of someone made in the image of God, we are in fact insulting the image of God. So we have to be very cautious about that. You see, Peter is saying that one of the dangers of a believing community that is in a hostile environment being persecuted is to sort of have this sanctified arrogance and disrespect, forgetting that the only difference between us and them is the grace of God. I mean, isn't that what Paul says in Titus 3? Submit yourselves to the government and all these particular things, for you yourselves were once foolish and disobedient and slaves to all these things just like them. But when the kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not by deeds that we did in righteousness, but by his own mercy. The only difference between us and unbelievers is God's grace. You see, when we forget that and we stop honoring all people, we stop recognizing the dignity of human life and the respect which is necessary to be paid to it, we're in big trouble because we're dishonoring God and his image in that person. So we ought not to speak evil of anyone that God has told us to submit to because it tarnishes our testimony for Christ and it dishonors our maker in whose image they are ultimately made. Second, Peter says, continually love the brotherhood, present imperative. Peter calls believers the brotherhood here like he does in chapter 5, verse 9. And what he's saying here is that there's a spiritual family that's been created by the new birth. And we ought to love every one of our brothers and sisters in the spiritual family with a genuine self-sacrificing love seeking their highest good, just like we saw back in chapter 1, 22 to 25. We're to have that disposition and we're to display that disposition in the midst of a hostile and unholy world as a witness to the people around us. Third, Peter says, continually fear God. And we said when we looked at 1 Peter 1.17 that the fear of God is not a paralyzing terror, but a fear of grieving the heart of the God we love and a fear of God's fatherly displeasure and discipline that ultimately compels us to obey him even when no one else is looking because we know that God is always looking and we truly desire to please him. See, if you truly fear God, then you will tremble at his word, Isaiah 66.2. Your greatest terror and dread will not be the news that you got cancer. It will not be the news that you got laid off from your job. 
It'll be the thought of ever sinning against God. The thought of ever distrusting God and thus disobeying God and displeasing and dishonoring Him. And the greatest passion and pleasure of your life and priority of your life will be to honor Him. Isn't that what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5? We make it our ambition to be pleasing to Him, whether in the body or away from the body. That's what a true fear of the Lord leads to. I fear ever dishonoring Him. My greatest passion and pleasure is to honor Him, to obey Him, to submit to Him. To glorify Him through uncompromised, faith-filled obedience to Him, regardless of what the governmental authority is like, and regardless of whether or not anyone else is around or looking, because I'm living before Him and His all-seeing eye. And then fourth, Peter says, continually honor the King. As we noted in 2.13, the word King certainly brings to mind the Emperor to Peter's readers here. So Peter says here that he is to be included in the honor and respect given to all. Peter's saying here that believers are to honor the king and to show him respect because of his office. They're not to fear him. Only God is to be feared. Peter may even be taking a shot at the empire cult here that demanded emperor worship. Indeed, Peter was quite clear that his readers were not to fear other human beings, 1 Peter 3.6, 1 Peter 3.14, and that only God should be feared as the sovereign Lord. One writer says, the fear belongs only to God because he alone determines existence and non-existence. So the emperor is not to be feared, but Peter says he must be honored. Peter says you're to honor those who hold positions of authority. You may not always agree with the president of the government. They may not always be right and wise and good, but understand that God has placed them sovereignly in that position of authority over you, and that position of authority itself is worthy of your honor and esteem and your respect. And so as Christians, we're certainly not always going to agree with what the president or the government or what some other ruler does, but we should never demonstrate a heart that is refusing to honor the one whom God says deserves honor. So Peter turns from our creator, fear God, towards the crown, honor the king. And folks, you can't genuinely fear God and disregard and dishonor the king. And if you fear the king, you'll be dishonoring God because only he is to be feared. And so love for God translates into good citizenship, not because we're chiefly interested in politics, but because we're chiefly interested in Christ and the gospel and our witness to others around us. Therefore, we live in a society in a way that is consistent with our commitment to Christ. And so first comes our absolute allegiance to God. We must fear Him. And the significance here is that the underlying attitude and motivation of our su submission to human authority is to be the fear of the Lord. In other words, we're to submit to the governing authorities that God has placed over us because our hearts are driven by a reverential awe and devotion to Him. And then next comes our affectionate love for other believers. We love the brotherhood. And then comes our honor to the king and other believers. We honor the king. The king is not God. Only God is God. And yet God has ordained that we submit to the governing authorities that he's placed over us. And so think back to the story that I told at the beginning about the no U-turn sign. See, as I'm sitting there wrestling in my conscience over what to do, I'm thinking about the time that I'm going to save. And I'm thinking that there's no one around. I'm going to get away with it. I'm not going to get caught. That's what I was thinking about. But what I should have been thinking about is that even though the police were nowhere to be found, God was right there with me. You see, I should have been living before him and his all-seeing eye, fearing him. That's the heart of the one who submits in a way that honors God. The person who truly lives before God fears disobeying him and dishonoring him more than anything else. And thus saving a couple of minutes by making an illegal U-turn, or saving a couple dollars by lying on your taxes, or saving 10 to 15 dollars by burning an illegal copy of a movie no longer becomes an attractive option. Because you're now living for something greater and higher. You're now living before the eye of God. And your ambition is to please Him. To honor Him. To live for His smile and pleasure. And not for the instant gratification. And some fleeting temporal advantage that you can gain 
by compromising and disobeying. You see, submitting to the government shouldn't be a disgruntled, okay, I guess I got to go to the next exit. Rather, it should be a tremendous opportunity to worship God and to honor Him as the ultimate authority. You see, it's a godly fear that leads us to submission to human government because in submitting to the government, we're honoring God as the ultimate authority. You see, in the years ahead, you'll likely have countless opportunities to either obey or disobey human authority. And at times, it's going to be rather attractive and rather tempting to disobey human authority. There will be some obvious advantage that it will bring. And at times, those advantages will start to look so attractive, you'll start to play games in your mind where you're telling yourself lies about why it's not that big a deal, why it's okay to disobey just this once, or why this situation is different than normal circumstances. And the advantages are really good, and no one else will know. You won't get caught. Well, you need to see those moments as divine tests that God has put in your path to help you discern where your heart is truly at before Him. Not before human authority, but before divine authority. Those are tests and opportunities to live out your salvation and your citizenship as an alien and a stranger here in this world by abstaining from the fleshly lust that tempts you to resist authority to govern yourself instead of submitting to God and His authority is mediated to you through the government. And it's an opportunity for you to keep your behavior morally excellent among the unbelieving world so that they might see your good deeds. They might see your submission. They might see your morally upright and excellent character and perhaps God will use your testimony and your transformed life to lead to their conversion and to the great glory of God and ultimately to the everlasting good of their souls. Folks, we need to realize that life isn't ultimately about us. It's about God, and it's about the people He's placed around us. Because both God and people are watching us. And when we live morally excellent lives by joyfully submitting to the human authorities that God has placed over us, in particular the government here, we not only have the privilege of glorifying God, but of being powerful and potent gospel witnesses that might even lead to the conversion of others and to the glory of God as well. But when we live sinful, selfish lives ruled by fleshly lusts of pride and insubordination, we not only dishonor God and defame His name, but we destroy our gospel witness because we're just like the unbelieving world around us. There is no power in our witness, in our testimony. So our testimony can either have glorious results or truly tragic results depending on our submission and obedience to God and the human authorities that He's placed over us. And so when we come to that fork in the road, we need to submit to that authority that God has placed over us. Why? Because of our obligation to the human authority, verse 13 to 14a. Because of our loyalty to the Lord Jesus, verse 13a. Because of our testimony to the watching world, verse 14b to verse 15 and because of our commitment to a higher authority, verse 16 and verse 17. We must submit to them ultimately because of Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the clarity of Your Word. And I know everyone in here who's genuinely in Christ and has received the glorious salvation that, Paul, uh, that Peter has not only written about, but exploded in worship over in chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 2 verse 10 has a desire to live out that salvation, to live out their alien status here. And you so clearly tell us how to do it by abstaining from fleshly lusts and by keeping our behavior morally excellent around the unbelieving world that's around us so that they would see our lives and be converted by means of them and give glory to you. And we see the very first way to do this to deal with the fleshly lust of pride, wanting to dictate and determine what we can do, is the need to abstain from wanting to be governed by self-rule and to submit to your authority as mediated to us through the government. That's the way that we keep our lives, our behavior morally excellent. That's the way that we have powerful and potent gospel witness.
And Lord, we want that to be true of us. And so we ask that you would empower us by your spirit to do that very thing, that we would have a radiant testimony before the watching world. We ask, Lord, that you'd forgive us for all the times that we've made subtle compromises, all the ways in which we've dishonored you, all the ways that we've tarnished our testimony. We're thankful for the blood of Christ, which cleanses us. We're thankful for the empowerment of your spirit, which will enable us to do what you've called us to do. And we pray for any who are not in Christ, that you would save them from their sin by repenting and turning away from it and trusting Christ alone to bear their punishment and to provide for them the perfection they need. That they would be empowered to live the way you've called them to live for your glory and the good of others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.